Homo sapiens have existed for over 300,000 years. Countless other species of humans have existed before and after us. Some of these strange creatures were more ape than man. Others lived around the world millions of years before we did. They were our ancestors and they still live within us today. Seven million years ago, during the late Miocene, many strange animals roamed our planet. In Africa, deadly saber-toothed cats and large bears stalked the African plains. At this time, our ancestors were still bound to life in the trees. These animals would have looked very close to modern-day chimpanzees. In the trees, they are very dominant animals. Not even a leopard dares to go after a chimp in their element. The trees were their safe haven, but on the ground they are basically defenseless. Life was relatively good for our ancestors until a geological shift would change everything. At the same time the Himalayas were forming, one of the African plates rifted. Mountains formed which prevented moisture crossing from the Indian Ocean into East Africa. This caused much of East Africa to dry out. What was once lush forest now became a much more dry and mountainous region. Our ancestors were no longer able to stay in the trees all day. They had to venture out onto the landscape in order to find food and water. On the ground, these early hominins were poorly adapted to the landscape. Large groups would have been essential to surviving in this dangerous environment. There has been four species of early hominins discovered in Africa. Though these animals were still very chimp-like, they started to show more human traits like smaller jaws and canines. These animals lived hard lives and predators often ate the first men. 4.4 million years ago, human evolution started to pick up. This is when the first Australopithecines began to appear. These animals existed during a very important time in human history for they were the first human ancestors to be bipedal. Walking on two legs provides many benefits. On two legs, it is much easier to see over tall grass and long distances. This would have helped these animals look out for predators. In addition to this, standing upright is much more intimidating to predators. Modern day humans are sometimes able to scare off grizzly bears just by making themselves look bigger. Walking on two legs only uses a quarter of the energy as walking on all fours. And finally, it frees up the forelimbs while moving. This allowed early humans to carry things like food, their young, and even weapons. Australopithecines walked upright and had more human-like features but they still had a brain only slightly larger than that of a chimpanzee. Sexual dimorphism is a condition in which members of the same species differ based on sex. For example, human males on average are about 15% larger than females. In some cases, male australopithecines were 50% larger than the females. Males stood about 4.5 feet tall while females were only close to 4 feet. Large males could weigh up to 100 pounds while females only weighed about 70. Lucy is the name of a very famous specimen of the species Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy was 3 foot 7 and weighed 64 pounds. She had a small brain like that of a chimpanzee, but the pelvis and the leg bones were almost identical in function to that of modern humans. This showed with certainty that Lucy's species stood upright and walked erect. Lucy looked somewhat human, but at the same time so primitive. She was a full-grown adult at only 12 years old when she died. No one knows how she died, but there is evidence that a carnivore may have scavenged her after death. Her fossil dates back to 3.2 million years ago. At this time, it was long thought that this species was not using tools until recent evidence. Evidence on tool marks on fossilized bones have been attributed to Lucy's species Australopithecus afarensis. They most likely did not hunt this animal, but the use of sharp stone tools is a monumental leap in human development. It is one thing to use a random rock for a task, many animals do this, but to use a manufactured tool like a sharp stone flake would have been revolutionary for the time. These tools allowed these primitive people to scavenge calorie-dense meat and get at the nutritious marrow. A proposed theory about Australopithecines was that they would throw in rocks for defense. 
It makes a lot of sense. If there were 50 of these men throwing rocks at a predator, then it might think twice before attacking. The only problem with this theory is really hard to prove. As we know though, later species of human used throwing spears and other throwing devices, so it is plausible that these primitive people would use rocks for defense. Australopithecines were our distant ancestors and there is no doubt that they struggled for survival, but they survived and led to new species. Australopithecus afarensis branched off into two species, Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus aethiopicus. Africanus is the ancestor to all of our relatives. Aethiopicus branched off from the tree and became a new species separate from our own. Australopithecines lasted until about 2.1 million years ago when Africanus evolved into a new lineage of apes. This lineage is called Homo. Homo habilis is the earliest known species in this genus. In Latin this means handyman. This was because of the innovation that this species pioneered with tools. Though it was not the first hominin to use stoneflake tools, there's evidence of more widespread use and more sophisticated tools. This species was able to create these tools because of a huge increase in brain size. The Australopithecines and Paranthropus before them had brain sizes about 400 to 500 cubic centimeters. Homo habilis on average had a brain size of 640 cubic centimeters. This increase in brain volume allowed the species to be better at tool making, decisions, and social bonds, but it didn't come without a cost. Modern day human brains use 20% of our daily energy. Brains are costly organs, but if they're used right, they're worth it. Since this animal developed a bigger brain, it must have been more successful in its environment than previous hominins. It was most likely still not a hunter yet, but rather an opportunistic omnivore. Standing a mere 4 feet in height, it was still a very small and primitive hominin. Though it is in the genus Homo, it has been proposed to consider it as an Australopithecine instead. This species lived around other species of hominin, but it would prove to be more successful. Another species named Homo rudolfensis existed during this time as well. This species is slightly different from Habilis, but many consider them to be the same species. Either way, they would give way to the next great species of Homo. Homo erectus was the next great leap for humanity. It was the first species to use fire, complex tools, hunt large game, and also spread around the world. The average male individual was 5 foot 10 and 150 pounds. The frame of this animal and the changes in the anatomy of the shoulders allowed them to be much better at throwing. Males were about 25% larger than females, which is close to how Homo sapiens are. This species varied. Since it was very widely dispersed over such a long period of time, there is many subspecies. On average, Homo erectus's brain was 1,000 cubic centimeters. Some of the earlier members had smaller brain sizes, but the later surviving populations had brain sizes slightly smaller than modern day humans. The huge leap in brain size between Habilis and Erectus allowed for many more possibilities than any previous hominin. Homo erectus first appeared about 2 million years ago, but fossils have been found in Asia and Africa, so their real origin is unknown. Like I said earlier, these animals were the first to have used fire that we know about. Solid evidence that Homo erectus used and controlled fire dates back to 400,000 years ago, but there is plenty of evidence to show that they might have used it much earlier. 1.4 million year old clay shards have been found in Kenya that were heated to a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius. There is countless other sites that are disputed, but the common consensus is that Homo erectus controlled fire at the earliest 1.5 million years ago, and likely by 1 million years ago. Fire allows for thousands of possibilities. One of these, of course, would be warmth. In relatively warm places, the temp can plummet at night. Fire would let these people stay warm at night, as well as scare away any predators. Sitting around a fire may have been a very important step for hominin culture. By this point in hominin evolution, it is likely that language was already in use. Scholars assume that the first language developed in Homo habilis, so it is likely that Homo erectus was able to speak fairly well. I am sure you have all experienced conversations around campfires, and this may have been a crucial aspect to our ancestors' evolution. Social bonds allow for better teamwork and cultural evolution. The second major use is cooking. Cooking does a number of things for food. It softens bonds between the cells of tough plants and meat, which in turn makes them more digestible. Less energy is used digesting cooked food than raw food. Cooking is like a way to start digestion before entering the mouth. It also sterilizes the food from any foodborne illnesses which may lie within. A fairly common theory is that by cooking food, Homo erectus was able to get enough nutrition to have a large brain. With more calories to spare, a large brain seems like a good investment. Another good investment was drying meat. 
Drying meat with fire was perhaps a very important step in human history. This way, early humans could store food for the future. Besides cooking, fire actually provides new and better ways to hunt. Homo erectus and many other species of hominins started grass fires in order to control pest populations. This way they could maybe stop pest animals from stealing their food, and they could also eat any of the animals killed by the fire. Another strategy that these people may have used was using fire to corral an animal in a certain area where they then could hunt them in a set-up position. Fire was also used to fire hardened spears. Though evidence of fire hardened spears are not found till much later, it is probable that they used them. In China, they have found stone-tipped spears from a group known as Peking Man. Peking Man is a late surviving Homo erectus subspecies. The fact that they also made stone-tipped spears shows us that their tool making was very advanced. One of the most versatile and commonly found tools from this period was the hand axe. Hand axes were used for butchering meat, processing plants, and a thousand other uses. These axes were the multi-tools of their day and there are hundreds of discovered examples. Other tools have been found that may just look like bits of rock, but they're actually specialized tools. But what if Homo erectus also made seafaring vessels? Here's an article written about this possibility. It reads, while no remaining boats used by Homo erectus have been found, potential evidence of this species' habitation on isolated islands suggests that it may have been able to travel many miles across an open sea. In 2008, Russian researchers have found very primitive stone tools on Socotra, a completely isolated island more than 150 miles off the Horn of Africa and 240 miles off the coast of Yemen. The researchers estimate that their discoveries could be anywhere from 500,000 to 1 million years old, which is firmly within the time frame of Homo erectus. The possibility is that these men were able to create a boat or just travel to remote islands in some way is an indication of this species' intelligence. Another thing that these animals were known for was living in caves. The stigma around caves and cavemen is really unfortunate because these men were not dumb and they do not deserve to be remembered that way. Caves provide an excellent protection against the elements and good places to hide from predators. Homo erectus was not some primitive ape, but rather paved the way for all future hominids. They were a crucial step in human evolution and they pioneered so many things like controlled fire, complex tools, maybe boats, and possibly even a complex culture. Since Homo erectus was so widespread, this gave the opportunity for the species to evolve into new species. This is where the story of human history becomes very confusing. Anthropologists are still not certain of what relation these animals all share with each other. The next species to appear was Homo antecessor. This species first appeared in Western Europe 1.4 million years ago. Antecessor has been proposed to be the intermediate species between Homo erectus and future European species. This is still a theory and this may change with future findings. The next species to appear was Homo heidelbergensis. This species shows how these animals were getting closer and closer to modern humans. Heidelbergensis had a brain volume of 1230 cubic centimeters, making it only very slightly smaller than the average modern day human. Along with this, it had a smaller brow and smaller jaws. On average, the males were about 5'9 and 140 pounds. That is a normal height for a hominin, but at one point they averaged over 7 feet. According to Lee R. Berger of the University of Witzwatersrand, tibia and femora remains indicate that the populations of Homo heidelbergensis between 350,000 and 400,000 years ago were routinely over 7 feet tall. According to him, this was a short-lived experiment that lasted during a grassland expansion, which led to very large ungulates and antelopes. It is incredible that these hominins grew so large to take advantage of their ecosystem. Imagine coming across a tribe of people where they're all over 7 feet in height. Heidelbergensis was also a very advanced tool maker. A 400,000 year old site in Germany showed us the use of fire hardened spears to hunt prey. Eight spears were found alongside stone tools and horse remains. One of these spears was stabbed through the pelvis of the animal. At another site in Germany, a spear was found stuck in the ribs of a straight tusked elephant. They were not just burnt sticks, but rather highly sophisticated tools. They were balanced one-third the way down the shaft, which suggests that they were for throwing like a modern-day javelin. In their throwing qualities, the spears are equal to modern-day tournament javelins. During tests, athletes were able to throw these recreations 230 feet. The fact that they were able to take down prehistoric horses and elephants shows us how dominant these animals were. As you can see, these ancient men were creating highly sophisticated and deadly hunting tools 400,000 years ago. 
The Heidelbergensis that lived in Europe evolved into a Homo neanderthalensis, or as most people know them, Neanderthals. Neanderthals had short, stocky bodies, thick bones, a heavy brow, and large noses. The earliest fossils date back to 450,000 years ago. They are known from numerous fossils and stone tools. Neanderthals are usually portrayed as simple, brutish caveman, but that is a misconception. Neanderthals may have still been primitive in social skills, but their brains were bigger than modern humans. Modern human brains are about 1300 cubic centimeters on average. Neanderthal brains were 1600 cubic centimeters. 300 more cubic centimeters of brain volume is not something to scoff at. In comparison, the relatively primitive brain to Homo erectus had a brain volume of 1000. Modern humans only had 300 more than them and we were considered much smarter. So if Neanderthals had 300 more than us, they must have been geniuses. Well, no. Though they had larger brains, they were not smarter than us. Their extra brain was used for better vision and smell. Of course, we cannot be completely certain on how these animals were, but the fact that they had better senses than us is still amazing. At this time, 400,000 years ago, there existed a few hominin species around the world. We know that Homo heidelbergensis and Homo neanderthalensis both lived in Europe and in other parts of the world, Homo erectus was still abundant. The next species to evolve were Homo sapiens. Yes, the great species that encompasses every human around the world today. It is a bit of a mystery of what species Homo sapien derived from. Many think it was from populations of Homo erectus in Africa, but also many think it was Homo heidelbergensis. Either way, a species would evolve into the first Homo sapiens 350,000 years ago. Our species had many differences than the others. First of all, we had many different anatomical features. Human skeletons are relatively gracile and fragile compared to species like Neanderthals. This may seem like a very simple and unimportant thing, but it's actually the root for what made us so successful. Because of our weaker build, we became much better at forming groups and cooperating. Not only did we have weaker skeletons, but we also developed weaker muscles. There is evidence that the growth and complexity in human brains was due to the acceleration of metabolism evolution. Metabolism evolution is very complicated, but I'll sum up to you what has been discovered. A study using GCMS methodology looked at the differences between humans, chimps, and macaques in different regions of the brain. What they found was major differences in regions of the prefrontal cortex and the lateral part of the cerebral cortex. It is implicated that the complex associative functions such as reasoning, planning, social behavior, and general intelligence are located in this part of the brain. This evolution gave Homo sapiens distinct advantages among the other hominin species. We were smarter and had better teamwork than all of our relatives. This growth in brain function was paralleled with a drastic reduction in muscular strength. So the price we paid for a bigger brain was weaker strength. 300,000 years ago, when humans were still living in Africa, we lived alongside a few species of hominin. One of these species was Homo naledi. This species is a mystery in anthropology. It seems this small-brained ape had not evolved much since the day of the Australopithecines. Though it was bipedal and showed some characteristics of Homo, it was more like an Australopithecine. The hands of the animal were adapted to climbing and its diet consisted of roots and tubers. It is likely that it was a late surviving primitive ape that never moved on the way the other hominids did. Here's the map of the distribution of discovered humans 300,000 years ago. In Europe lived Homo heidelbergensis and Homo neanderthalensis, and in Africa lived Homo sapiens and Homo naledi. All around Europe and the Middle East lived populations of Homo erectus and many other subspecies that derived from it. Over the next thousands of years, humans would evolve and thrive all over the world. Things would stay relatively the same around the world except for a Homo heidelbergensis went extinct 200,000 years ago. The next great burst of human expansion would appear around 70,000 years ago. This is when we see many species emerge and others disappear. Homo sapiens ventured out of Africa at the earliest 150,000 years ago, but major migrations of humans out of Africa would start about 70,000 years ago. Here is a map of what human populations may have looked like before Homo sapiens left Africa 70,000 years ago. Keep in mind, there may be populations that we have not discovered, and also we don't know their true ranges. So let's go over this map. In Europe there still lived the Neanderthals. In Northern Asia and parts of Russia there lived Denisovans. Denisovans evolved from Homo heidelbergensis that went into Asia. Little is known about this species, but it is distinct from humans and Neanderthals. So in Southern Asia, there still live populations of advanced Homo erectus. These populations were much smarter and more advanced than the archaic Homo erectuses from millions of years ago. Homo floresiensis, also known as the hobbits, lived in Indonesia. 
These men on average were 3 foot 7. The reason they were so small is because of insular dwarfism, also known as island dwarfism. They possibly evolved to become small because of limited resources on the island. Alongside with a small body, they also had very small brains. Their estimated brain size is 380 cubic centimeters, making it the size of a chimp's brain. While I was making this video, a new species of Homo was actually discovered. Little is known about Homo luzonensis because we only have a few bones as of now. The curvature of the toe bone suggests that this animal may have still climbed trees often, and this species was very small as well. They might have been the same height as Homo floresiensis, but they also might have been smaller. These relatively australopithecine features of this animal suggest it to be primitive in nature, and it most likely evolved from populations of Homo erectus in the area. The discovery of this species shows us that there's still many species that have not been discovered. Then, 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens left Africa. By this time, we were the first species to invent the bow. Bows allowed us to be much more efficient hunters than any other hominin species. We could shoot arrows further and also shoot multiple shots in succession. This would help us take down large game and dominate in war. Though the other hominin species were stronger and more built than us, they couldn't compete with our weapons and our strategy. Humans were probably not getting in wars and battles with other tribes often, but when we did, we had the upper hand. We also bred with Neanderthals and Denisovans as we spread across the world. As soon as we left Africa, we met Neanderthals. This interbreeding would allow us the opportunity to inherit genes that were better adapted to the cold. The genes we inherited affected our skin color, brain function, and sleep patterns. Modern day Sub-Saharan Africans never left and therefore they never interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans. Because of this, most Sub-Saharan Africans are true purebred Homo sapiens while most other people have some other hominin DNA mixed in with them. As humans spread across the world, many of the other species would go extinct. By 20,000 years ago, Homo sapiens were the only species of Homo left. We were too successful and smart for the other species and most likely drove them to extinction. Though these other species are extinct, some of them still live within us today. As you can see by this map, populations of humans that left Africa have about 2% Neanderthal DNA. It varies and you may have more or less depending on their region. Populations in Oceania have the most DNA from extinct hominins. Some people have 2% Neanderthal DNA and 5% Denisovan DNA. That is crazy that 7% of their DNA is from extinct hominins. Sherpas are one of the major ethnic groups native to the mountainous regions of Nepal. It has been known for years that these people are very adapted to their mountainous environment. Here's an article about the genes that these people receive from Denisovans. It reads, A super athlete gene that helps Sherpas and other Tibetans breathe easy at high altitudes was inherited from an ancient species of human. That's the conclusion of a new study which finds that the gene variant came from people known as Denisovans, who went extinct soon after they mated with ancestors of Europeans and Asians about 40,000 years ago. This is the first time a version of a gene acquired from interbreeding with another type of human has been shown to help modern humans adapt to their environment. Researchers discovered in 2010 that Tibetans had several genes that helped them use smaller amounts of oxygen more efficiently, allowing them to deliver enough of it to their limbs while exercising at high altitude. It is crazy that these humans are more adapted to their environment because they bred with Denisovans 40,000 years ago. I can't imagine how many other genes humans have acquired from other extinct species of hominin that we do not know about that may help us in our environments. The human story is one of failure and success. Many species before us spread around the world, but ultimately it would be Homo sapiens that would reign supreme. We conquered the world and interbred with the inhabitants. It is unfortunate that there are no other species of Homo left, but a few species still live within us today. Thanks for watching this video. In the coming years, the information displayed may be obsolete. I put a lot of effort into producing this video, but I am sure I made some mistakes. If you have noticed any scientific inaccuracies or just mistakes in this video, leave a comment down below correcting me. I truly think that it is unfortunate that there are no other species of hominin left. I can only imagine the way that they would have affected human history. You'd hear about ancient tribes of Neanderthals dominating other human species, but no, they all had to go extinct. Just wonder how it would affect our modern history as well. In the early 1900s, there'd probably be segregation against Neanderthals or put them to work as slaves or something, and maybe they'd dominate professional sports now. Like, I can imagine in like MMA, how good do you think a Neanderthal would do? It'd be so much stronger than everyone else. 
I don't know, it's just a thought of mine. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about our human story, and I plan on making more anthropology videos in the future. This video was a summary of human history, but there's thousands of more things to learn about our human past that I hope to make videos of in the future. I did not cover anything past 20,000 years ago, because by that time, all other hominin species were extinct, and humans were pretty much the same as they are today. So thanks for watching this video, I really hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya.